Brad, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Hey, Brad, it's great to have another physician here on the podcast, and you were one in the area of clinical psychology, and then you made this transition to where you are today, which is mainly financial planning, but I know you're involved in a lot of different things. You're involved in the mental health world. You're involved in the investment, the planning world, and so maybe you can just kind of share with us how this transition happened. How did you go from clinical psychology to financial planner? Yeah, great question. Um, Mainly because I screwed up around money. So when I got out of graduate school, I owed $100,000 in student loan debt. And um, I grew up lower middle class. You know, my mom, it's so funny. She likes to say we were middle class except lower. (laughs) And I'm like, mom, they they have, you know, they have names for that. Um, But anyway, so I, so I grew up in that, in that frame of mind, but um, I had very uh, conservative parents who um, were really focused on saving. They want to teach me to save. They didn't have much money but it was something they were very concerned about. And I was taught to never have any debt. So this is one of the things I grew up with. Like debt is bad. Don't do it. To get to grad school though, I had to take on student loans. So I got out of school. I owed a hundred thousand dollars in student loan debt. Um, I was very uncomfortable with that, which is why I told you where I came from. And um, I saw a friend of mine make a hundred thousand dollars trading stocks in one year. And I thought, great idea, you know, because this friend of mine knew nothing about the stock market and I knew nothing about the stock market. So I thought that this is something that I could do. And so I sold what I had of value, which at that time was mainly a truck that I had. And I put all my money in the stock market and I was living um, life of a pauper. I had like um, lawn chair for furniture. I was all in on this, like I'm going to get out of debt. And I had a fabulous three months or so. And then the tech bubble burst Mm. and agonizing experience. And for any listeners that you have who've lived through that, they know what I'm talking about. Um, Really difficult experience for me watching my money melt away. And um, as a clinical psychologist, I, you know, thankfully, I think I blamed myself. And this is one of the things we've done research on looking at what separates the ultra wealthy from middle class individuals. And one of those components is it's called internal locus of control, but essentially it's how much you take personal responsibility for what's happening in your life. So luckily, I had been trained on an internal locus of control, and I knew this was a good thing. So I set about trying to blame myself for everything in my life, which is actually a really helpful way to go through life. Um, And so I I thought, okay, so why would a reasonably intelligent person do something so stupid with his money? So that was the question I was asking myself. And then what I did is I I went into um, the literature in psychology, which is what we're trained to do. Let's find studies on it. What can we know about this? And there was nothing done, basically. So essentially, there were no studies done on the psychology of money and our relationship to money. And so I sort of accidentally uh, became one of the, um, you know, leading individuals in this field, mainly because the field of psychology had utterly ignored the topic of money. Um, So I, I sort of joke, within a matter of a few weeks, I became the world's leading expert in financial psychology because psychologists have totally avoided the concept of money historically. And I actually did a study on that too. So psychologists and mental health people have a tendency to be money avoidant, believing that there's sort of a negative association with money or having money is bad or rich people are greedy or there's virtue in having less money, that kind of thing. And so the entire field was money avoidant. And, and so anyway, there, there's, and what's so interesting about it too, Casey, is that money is the biggest source of stress in the lives of Americans. And it always has been, probably always will be but it was a ignored topic in the field of psychology. So anyway, that's how I became really interested in it was trying to sort out my own beliefs around money. Like, why did I do what I did? And I actually got on a plane, went home and I interviewed my family members, um, almost like an anthropologist. Like, so mom, what was it like for you growing up around money? And I did the same thing with my father. And I heard all these stories that had dated back generations in my family, which I had never heard of. And I was like, oh my goodness. So, So all of a sudden my behaviors around money my beliefs around money started to make total sense to me. So why would a reasonably intelligent person do something so stupid with his money? Well, it, it traced all the way back into my family line and I could see the patterns, um, which was frankly a, a psychological relief for me. It's like, it's like, well, no wonder I did something like that. Um, it would have been really predicted to do something like that. But these were stories nobody had ever talked about. And um, so anyway, that, that's one of my passions. And you can probably hear in my voice that I'm passionate about this is these untold stories that um, lead to these beliefs that are clanking around in our subconscious minds and they drive all of our financial behaviors. 
Well, I want to dig into your psychology a little bit around that experience. So we're talking about a very early experience in the stock market for you. And for me, this was the 2008 financial crisis. That's when I got started in the business of financial planning. Uh, you got started following the tech bubble, but both of our early experiences in investing uh, resulted in some pretty significant losses and some painful experiences around the market. And I wonder how that has carried over to impact you today. I know for me, you know, those early experiences, I recognize that I have a bias where I take a very, some might say ultra conservative approach with my own personal finances probably because of those early experiences I had around money and also the, what I saw from my grandparents, and my dad. But yeah, then you've got other advisors that say started in the 80s or 90s in a big bull market and they had a very good early experience. And I tend to think they continue to advise in a more aggressive way and take more of an aggressive approach to their personal finances. But I'm wondering how that impacted you personally to this day. Now we're talking 20 years down the road. Yeah. So, um, it did have an impact on me for sure. And I think initially I was very frightened after that. You know, after you have that loss experience, your your brain wants to make sure that you don't have another loss experience. It's sort of designed to protect you. And so, um, you know, you have a tendency to avoid things that have bitten you. <laughs> Use that as an example. Like um, if you're bitten by a snake, your brain says, stay away from anything slithering, right? And so when you have a painful experience like that related to investing, it's not uncommon at all for people to be uh, have an aversion towards investing or, or to be conservative. Um, and so that was certainly the case for me in the years that followed until I got more educated, until I started to read some of the research on, um, you know, investing and, and became a financial planner myself, mm -hmm. but definitely had an impact on me. Um, and this is something that we see culturally too. Like, you know, the, if you ever knew anyone who lived through the Great Depression, um, they, a lot of them became hoarders, like ultra conservative hoarders. Um, like that's what I, one of the things I discovered in my family history is my grandfather lost all of his money and the family's money when the banks collapsed in the Great Depression. And I didn't know that story until my mother shared that with me after I was interviewing her. And what I didn't know either is he died in his 90s and he never put a dollar in the bank the rest of his life. So that that sense of like, I can't trust banks was so hardwired for him based on that experience. And, and so when he, he died in his 90s, he, he kept all his money in a lockbox in his attic, like never even put it in the bank. And so those types of experiences are very profound, and sometimes they're quite traumatic. And you talked back about 2008. I did a study on post-traumatic stress in financial planners back in 2008, and that's exactly what we saw. So I was trained as a psychologist. I'm like, wow, these people um, seem to have some similar symptoms to people who have experienced a traumatic event, and definitely the case. So over 90% of the advisors that we studied had those symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And if you, were, if you had money in the market, you probably have some too. Because you watched it melt away, you're worried about your retirement, some people were losing their homes, very traumatic experience for many, many people. And um, the problem with those types of experiences is sometimes it clouds your vision about what's happening in the future. And that's why it's so important to process that emotion and, and think about it and just really shine some light on it. Because otherwise, you'll end up like my grandfather who's like, you can never trust banks. And the interesting thing about those beliefs, um, in our research, we call them money scripts is that they're 100% accurate in a certain situation. So mm -hmm. for example, if my grandfather had that belief he can't trust banks with your money before the Great Depression, he would have done fabulous, right? Um, but, the, but the situation changed, right? So federal government came in starting to guarantee bank accounts. So the situation changed. And at that point, his belief became highly dysfunctional. So, and that, that's, anyway, sorry about that. No, it's um, all right. No, I've had a very similar experience with my grandparents, you know, Great Depression era, and we're very conservative. You know, I, I always uh, kind of think back to a little game we used to play after my grandfather passed away. After uh, my grandfather passed away, we'd go visit grandma and uh, we'd play a little game called Find the Money because the money was in the house somewhere, right? And it was in these old coffee cans in the cellar. And um, my grandfather laid carpet for a living, so he lined under, underneath the carpet full of cash. Um, it was just a, a different approach. And I think that that fear or that concern, you know, sometimes 
I think there's benefits from learning from that too, rather than just saying, you know, all these emotions are bad, all these stories are bad. I need to just move on past them and get educated. You know, I still look back at my grandfather and go, well, he still was a carpet layer making, you know, in the peak of his earning years, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, you know, worth well over a million dollars when he passed away he was still doing okay, did what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. And, you know, maybe it's, it's not all bad. Maybe we can take something away from those experiences. Now, do I put everything under my mattress and put it under my carpet today? No, absolutely not, because I have educated myself on a better approach. However, I still think there's some benefit from those scars of our past. Absolutely, Casey. And there, there's something in psychology called post-traumatic growth. And it's that if we, if we can go through these, these experiences, and by the way, everyone's had a, a traumatic experience of some kind or very emotionally intense experience. Um, and if we process those correctly, we're actually better off, frankly, on the other end for having that experience. We've learned new things. We have a new perspective. We probably, we maybe we even have an appreciation for things that we didn't quite appreciate and, or know how good we had it. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's an incredible learning opportunity as long as you process it correctly and you think about it and you work through some of those emotions, it can become damaging when it, it becomes something that we don't ever want to look at again. And we've sort of arrived at a conclusion around how the world works. And then we're inflexible in our thinking. And that's, that's really one of the keys to um, success. It's one of the keys to doing well and actually being well adjusted is something called open mindedness and being willing to be flexible in your thinking around things. Because circumstances are constantly changing. You know, the stock market is a great example. Constantly changing. And if you have a certain set of rigid beliefs around how this is supposed to work, that's when people have a tendency to get into trouble. These like beliefs, like for example, the belief that real estate will always go up in value. Like this was a very popular cultural belief. I don't think as many people have that belief <laughs> after 2008. It doesn't always go up in value. Um, but that's an example of a belief that can be, um, if it's rigidly held, it can really trip you up. So having that flexibility in thinking is really, is really key. Well, I'm wondering how we learn from these and, and teach from these points as advisors uh, or you individually. I know one of the questions you just brought up is, you know, what was money like when you were a kid? That was a question you were asking, say, parents and grandparents. And that's another question that we always ask in the first visit with the families that, that we're sitting down and consulting with. And I'm wondering how you best use that information. If you're asked, if the listeners sitting there, they're asking themselves, yeah, what was money like when I was a kid? Yeah, how do they then take that information, process it to benefit in the future? And yeah, so there's there's if you can think of uh, three different intersecting um, circles with lines. So think of a triangle, and and at each ed edge of the triangle is a circle. And so the top circle is is your early experiences around money, or we call them financial flashpoints in our writing and in our research. And those are those early memories you have around money, those early experiences. Sometimes, again, it could be your grandparents' experience that you never heard about, but they pass down the feelings and the beliefs. And then in, in, the, in another circle is your money scripts. So these are your beliefs around money. So you have these early experiences. We all have these experiences around money. They lead to a set of beliefs around money. How does money work? You know, what, are, what, what, are, what, what do we know about rich people? What are your beliefs around poor people? What are your beliefs around buying things in terms of status, the importance of saving? All these things are beliefs that are directly related to experiences you had quite often as a child or even passed down to you from your grandparents and, and parents and grandparents. And then those things directly lead to your financial behaviors. And we've done studies on all of this, actually. So they all connect. So if we know your beliefs around money, we can predict your financial behaviors, your, in, your income, your net worth, your credit card debt, um, a whole host of financial behaviors based on these beliefs. So to answer your question, Casey, it's really important to know where you came from and those early experiences. And then the next step is how did those experiences impact your beliefs around money, about retirement, about investing, um, about, about how money works in the world in relationships? Like, is it a dangerous topic in relationships to talk about? Or is it something that can bring you closer? Did you grow up with parents in conflict around money? These things all lead to beliefs around money. And all of our studies have shown those beliefs predict your financial behaviors and outcomes. 
then I, I'm wondering if it's even possible to, to change the behavior ultimately. And I, when I think about this, I, I go to those individuals that will sit down with, I'm sure you've met them. Uh, their parents lost everything in the stock market during the Great Depression. And then their parent, they, they lost, you know, half their life savings in the tech bubble, sold when the market was down, didn't make up any of their losses. And they're going, you know what? Yeah the market is just a bad place to be. I shouldn't be investing. And then you might say, well, why can't you invest today? And they'll say, well, I'm 65 years old. You know, I, I can't put any money in the stock market. And then you have to go back and, you know, help them realize that, you know, had we done X, Y, and Z, then over 30 years, and, and you still have 30 years of investing when you're 60, 65 years old, just not on all of your money, you can still afford some risk and it's a good idea. You know, is it even possible to overcome that? And, and maybe, maybe it's not even necessary to overcome it in some circumstances. Fabulous question. And the answer is it depends. So for me and for you and for your listeners, if you think back to some of these early experiences, like if you don't know stories about your grandparents, um, your parents, try to find out what some of what was passed down to you. Because sometimes just an awareness of that can totally shift your behavior. It's, it's, you think of it as an aha moment. You're like, oh my goodness, I got so risky in the stock market because I'm sort of trying to do the opposite of my family who are ultra conservative. No wonder I got hurt. No wonder I took on more risk. And just seeing that pattern for some people, you know, snap, you shift your beliefs because all of a sudden it makes sense and it's in perspective. However, when you have emotional intensity associated with that belief, so for example, um, you know, back to the Great Depression example, like if you live through the experience of poverty, not having enough to eat, worried about, you know, th- being able to survive in those situations, sometimes that can be a deeply traumatic experience, which leads to a bunch of emotions. And so the belief, for example, from people who live through the Great Depression and people who grew up in poverty can be, don't, there's not enough money. There's not enough money. And if that belief is really held intense, intensely by emotion, that's when it can become difficult to change. Mm-hmm. Sort of the, exam- the iconic example, the topic of my first book was Ebenezer Scrooge from Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Great example of a guy who grew up in poverty and was traumatized by that, had this belief there'll never be enough money, and so went ahead and acquired a bunch of money, became extremely wealthy, but lived a life of abject poverty. So he wasn't heating his house. He was eating gruel. He was basically having that experience of poverty because he had so much fear around not having enough. And so when there's a lot of emotional intensity around it, that's when it becomes more difficult to shift. Mm -hmm. So would you say then emotions can be healthy when it comes to investing? I mean, we often hear, well, you know, you have to have all emotions have to be removed. You have to think of this, you know, purely in, you know, a a, a logical way. You need to take emotions out of investing. Uh, Are there still some uses for emotions though? Because it sounds like there's still benefits of having emotions involved in your investment decisions, but maybe it's just those extreme emotions. Am I getting that correct? Well, well, good luck um, getting rid of your emotions related to <laughs> investing or anything else. Um, I, you know, and I don't see it that way. I think that you're going to have emotions. So emotions are just part of the deal. The question is, you, you know, what I've been telling people recently too is like, go ahead and panic. You know, just don't do anything stupid. <laughs> you know, it's like, like panic is real. The feelings are real. Oh no, I'm not, I'm going to lose all my money. You know, and like the recent um, stock market experience is actually very similar to the last one and the one before that. The beliefs are all the same. The belief is that, oh no, I'm going to lose all my money. Oh no, the market may never recover. Um, But this time it's different. That's another one you see during all the crisis, but this time it's different. So all the stuff you were saying worked last time, you know, it's not going to apply now. This time it's different. These, you're going to have those thoughts. You're going to have the feelings that accompany those thoughts and successful investor and advisors, they know that they're going to have those feelings. And they experience those feelings. And again, you're going you're gonna to experience them, but you don't act on those feelings. And that, that mm-hmm. is, of course, the challenge, right? It's like when we become emotionally charged, we become rationally challenged. We will do things that are self-destructive. And we've all had this experience. I'll give you an example. I'm sure you've had an argument with a loved one at some point in your life. You could think of your spouse, you know, your partner, and if you have a teenage child, um, and what happens is the more emotionally aroused you get, so the more upset you get, um, you, your prefrontal cortex, which is your thinking part of your brain, the part of your brain that's around judgment, around foresight, around making wise decisions and thinking about consequences, that part of your brain shuts off. 
So essentially your emotional brain gets really big. It shuts off your um, prefrontal cortex, your, your part of your brain that's responsible for good sound decision making. And then you end up saying something or doing something that is out of character. Perhaps you regret it later. And what happens is about 20 minutes later, you calm down, your rational brain comes back online and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. You know, I, I sound just like my father <laughs> or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes back on and then you evaluate what you did and then you have some remorse, you know, because you're a, you're a thoughtful person and then you go apologize <laughs> to your wife or husband. Um, but that, that's, that's what happens, right? That's what happens to us emotionally. And so when you're in the midst of that emotional arousal, the key is to not act, basically, to not make a decision, especially around your finances. Um, this part of your brain, this animal part of your brain and the scientist part of your brain, it, it's what's kept us alive as a species for thousands of years because really it's, it's sort of this fight flight. It's like there's a threat, run away or fight to survive. And that it, it's an on or off switch too. It, it's not very, um, it's not very, you know, refined in the sense of like, Oh, should I, how much should I worry about this? Because you think about it. If there's a, if there's a tiger right there, you can't sit there and go, huh, I wonder if this is a tame tiger. I mean, by the time you've done that, you've already been eaten. Right. So it, it makes you act immediately. And so that's your impulse is to act immediately and aggressively in some fashion. And knowing that really helps just being aware that that's how your your brain works. And if you act in the midst of that anxiety and that um, that intense emotion, it's going to be self-destructive typically when it comes to money. So then the question is, you know, what do we do, right? And I'm wondering, I mean, we're in this period of time, you know, we're, we're here at the very beginning of April. It's almost April 1st here. So kind of an interesting time to be able to have uh, what's going on out there in the market and have this conversation. Uh, and, you know, the market was down 30% at one point. And I'm sure you had to field at least one phone call of someone that was concerned, said, hey, I, I'm panicking and I want to go, I want out, you know, get me out of the market. I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to lose any more money. How did you address that individual? Did you just say, you know, okay, don't panic or go ahead and panic. How, how did that conversation go? what did you have them do? Do we have to distract ourselves in some way? Well, you know, the panic is real and the fear is real. And so, you know, first of all, what I do is I don't tell people to calm down like that. That's actually the worst thing. If you've ever really been upset and somebody asks, tells you to calm down, you know, I mean, you want to punch them in the nose, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, that hasn't worked well with my wife. I'm still exactly, working on that myself. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Learn the lesson. Um, and so that's not very helpful. So people have legitimate fears. And so there's a few things that I, that I do related to it. First of all, um, people have a right to self-determination, right? So um, essentially, I'll say, look, hey, if, if you want to go to cash, look, at the end of this call, we'll do it. You know, I mean, th- this is your life. This is your money. I mean, that's always really important for to just sort of reiterate for people. Um, but just also understanding how the brain works will we'll build in some conversations that can be actually really useful. So for example, um, I'm sure you know a little bit about mental accounting. You've probably heard of it in terms of behavioral finance, but it's sort of our natural tendency to want to put things into buckets and treat them differently. And so one of the things I do with clients is harness that natural tendency, which by the way, screws up a lot of parts of your financial life. Um, But in this case, it really helps. So when you see the headline that says the stock market's down 10%, you know, there's red, there's a bunch of flashing things, all these alert signs, you know, you're going to start, your palms are going to sweat, you're going to get nervous, you're going to start thinking, oh no, I'm losing all my money. But they're talking about, just for example, you know, one aspect of the market. So they're talking about, you know, the S&P 500, for example, is constantly being shown on television. Well, that's large cap U.S. stocks. That's one asset class, right? And so one of the ways that I will help clients take a more accurate look at what's happening is to separate, just for example, equities in one bucket, bonds and cash in another bucket, and then examine those two buckets and how have they been doing. Yes, stocks are down 30%. Wow. Okay, well, 30% of your portfolio is in stocks and 70% is in bonds or cash. So let's look how that's doing. Um, and so just by separating that out, actually most calms most people down because it's a more accurate reflection of what's actually happening to their money. Mm-hmm. Um, so th- that's an example, um, that, one example that, that I found extremely helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the bucket discussion, you know, to, to have with families. And because I do think that a lot of the, the problems that come up in a retirement plan are psychological. So uh, if you look at your plan and go, hey, I've got everything in this one portfolio and it's just this one statement and this one investment portfolio and it's down X, 
you know, it's difficult to isolate the fixed income, say, in there, the bonds, and say, well, my near-term needs are taken care of. You know, I can let those equities rebound. So I think there's benefits in structuring plans in such a manner as well. And I'm wondering, you know, we're having this conversation a minute ago. You said, um, you know, we all have emotions. You know, we're, we're all human. And so there's no way to eliminate the emotion altogether. We're all going to have behavioral pitfalls. And when I talked to, I, I spoke to Dan, Dr. Daniel Frosby not that long ago, uh, also a behavioral finance expert. And in his discussion, he said, you know, he's got his own issues and he needs a coach with him to make sure that uh, he doesn't, you know, fall, fall, you know, victim to his own behavioral pitfalls. And so I'm wondering for you, uh, what are your behavioral pitfalls that you still have to this day? And what do you do to keep them in check? Yeah, no, that, that's a really great question and a really important question too, um, because we all have them. And, and one of the biggest vulnerabilities is if you believe you're immune. That's actually one of the sickest things that, that we can deal with as human beings that will sabotage us. It's believing that all these other people have this issue. It'll never happen to me. Um, so it's actually a sign of, of your own psychological growth and evolution to, to sort of admit and, and be aware that you are human too and you're extremely vulnerable to this. And as advisors too, um, I'd say you're even more vulnerable because it's not just your retirement or it's your parents' retirement, your best friends, your clients who you love. Like these are, you know, this isn't Wall Street um, situation for most advisors where they've never met any of the people they're invited. These are people you love and care yeah. about. And so your people, you know, as an advisor, you're even perhaps more emotionally invested and involved. And so it's critical to understand that you are utterly um, susceptible to these things. Um, and it actually helps you become less susceptible just by knowing that and admitting it. Um, but one of the things that I, that I do is, is so, I, you know, you, I told you where I came from, a fear of not having enough combined with parents who um, were, were savers, like aggressive savers, like there's not enough, we're going to save. So that's sort of my my upbringing. And so um, I definitely have in the back of my mind, the sense that, you know, there, there's not going to be enough money. Because um, it goes back for generations in my family, I'm very much aware of this voice. And what that has led to in my life is, is essentially workaholism. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the slippery slopes for me yeah. is, is being a work, total workaholic. And, and I love my work, you know, don't take it away from me. It's not an issue. Um, you know, so for me anyway, that's one of my slippery slopes. And so that's something that I have to combat like on a daily basis. And I had to come up with my own little mantra. Um, I call it a money mantra that to get me off the desk and go home to be with my family and my kids, because that, that sort of drive to work. And I understand what's driving it too. It's not just that I love what I'm doing. It's also this underlying multi-generational fear of like being poor. Um, and not being, yeah. and not making that, um, want, not wanting that for my family. So that sort of drives, is a driving force yeah. in my life. I'm aware of it though. And therefore I am not acting as a workaholic. I have the tendency, but I, but I cut it off and I go home and I'm there with my wife and kids. And I have to actually tell myself this. I, I actually wrote it on a card that I, that I would read every day for years. I actually did this. It's like, um, I, I worked hard. I'm happy with what I did. I love my wife. I love my children. I'm going to go home right now and spend time with them. I've done enough for today. I literally had to say this to myself to override this programming. Right. Well, you might have seen um, my exam come through that I, I took your survey or your quiz on your website, the KMBI survey that clunts money behavior inventory. Mm -hmm. And I was only out of line on the workaholism line. And so that was a 3.6 on workaholism, not, not wildly out of control, but that was only a mark that was over three. And I think that's a common thing that we're going to see as financial planners and advisors. I mean, we're typically working with uh, wealthier individuals that have been focused on saving and accumulating and working. And now as we specialize in working with retirees, I know you work with a lot of retirees, when they make that transition into retirement, getting them to spend some money is just is one of the biggest hurdles that we have to go through 
right now, you know, or later this day, I've got a review with um, a couple that we've been working with for uh, six or seven years, right? And when we first met them, um, yeah, he didn't he didn't think he could retire. One, the number one reason he didn't think he would retire is because he was making too much money. You know, he was making over a million dollars a year, and and he goes, "Why? Well, you know, I just can't walk away with this, walk away from this, right?" And the reality was, he was making money for someone else, not himself, right? Because he was never going to spend what he had, mm. you know, driving an old car, uh, sitting around, say, $15, $20 million in net worth. And I still have yet to get them to spend any of their life savings. And today we're going to talk about it again. So you are a clinical psychologist, and I'm hoping you give me a little advice. How can I get them to spend some money? Because they're just so used to living this conservative life, accumulating. You know, Finally, I got them to retire, but I still can't get them to really spend some money. Uh, what would your guidance be? And, you know, what, what would you say to that individual? Yeah. So first of all, I can totally relate. Like some of our most successful clients are the ones who just saved and didn't spend anything, you know, um, and worked really, really hard. Right. And so that is a really challenging shift for many people to make. Um, the whole idea of accumulating versus actually, you want me to take money out of that? Are you kidding me? And and one of the reasons they are where they are is because they've sort of kept it sacred, right? Yeah. They've never allowed themselves yeah. to mm-hmm. use that money to buy a bass boat or to go on a vacation or whatever yeah. it is, right? <laughs> um, so I can totally relate. And, um, you know, so a few different things that, I, that come to mind. So one is that a lot of people don't have a really fleshed out vision of retirement. So they don't really have a clear um, passionate sort of idea of who they want to be with, what they want to be doing, what it looks like, what it feels like. Um, And that's a really powerful one. So we recently did a study where we put people into one of two groups. One was a financial literacy group where we taught people why they should save, how to save, that kind of thing. The other one, what we had them do is create these really powerful, vivid visions of their savings goals. And what we saw in that group was a 73% increase in savings, which is just amazing, right? The other group had about a 22% increase. So the education helps. But this vision is so critically important. And so what I find with a lot of people who struggle with experiencing retirement or even um, stopping working is a couple things. Number one, work is probably giving them a tremendous amount of psychological benefit. So it's probably not just the money. Mm -hmm. It's probably social. So, you know, especially, you know, not to stereotype, but if you're a male, especially just based on all the studies, um, you know, a lot of times males aren't very um, adept at creating social interactions and connections outside of work. And so it's a bit of a scary thing. It's like I might lose all my friends. I might lose a lot of social interaction if I stop working. So that's one thing that might keep me going to work. The other thing is a sense of purpose. Like if my entire sense of purpose is built up in my image of myself as an earner, or as a producer, or as whatever that profession is, that could be another thing that can be, frankly, a loss to let go of. And so those are powerful forces that will keep us working, frankly, and not stopping working, or whatever your definition of retirement is. And to really balance that out, you need to create a very specific, exciting vision of what retirement is and why you want to do it. Um, What's so interesting, if you haven't done that, Um, Like people in my family, my father realized he wasn't saving for retirement for years. When he sat down and thought about it, he realized it's because in his mind, you retire and then you die. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You retire and then you're useless. You're of no benefit to the family. So he realized, whoa, this is sort of like a a deeply held thing that he saw in his family. Um, My great grandfather in his 90s, he couldn't walk and he would actually crawl out the front door and drag himself up on a golf cart and drive it over to a tractor and crawl up on top of the tractor to go work in the fields all day. So this is the model my father grew up with. And it's like, well, no wonder you're resistant to retirement. You have like a terrible vision of retirement. So retirement means you're useless and then you die. We need to develop another vision of retirement. And so I think sometimes that's lacking for people. It's like, what is that exciting thing that's going to get me up every day, that's going to meet my social needs, that's going to meet my needs for purpose in life? And, and my self-esteem. And if I don't have that, it's really tough to pull the trigger. 
Well, I want to get into the vision thing, but I also want to address this from the inverse too, because we have people that are overspending at the same time. Um, my One of our advisory team members was, uh, we were working on a case together recently, he said, I, I just don't know how to handle this because uh, they're spending $25,000 a month and they want to retire. They want to spend $25,000 a month. They've got less than $3 million saved for retirement. You know, we're looking at, you know, roughly a 10% withdrawal rate from their portfolio and they're upset saying, I don't know why this isn't possible. I don't know why we can't do this. You know, this seems perfectly acceptable. If the market's average say 10% a year, why can't we take 10% out of the portfolio? We're not cutting back. You know, I, I have trouble, you know, how do you handle that conversation? One, you've got to educate. And then two, you, you've, You've got it. You've probably got to figure out this emotional attachment to spending. But hey, I'm talking to the expert here. Yeah. So you know th that's a very common disconnect for people. So it could be a couple of things. Number one, it could be a lack of awareness on what they're actually spending on. Like that is something that many of us are vulnerable. Um, I you know I, I'm sure you've had the experience where you've looked back at a, a, either a credit card statement or something. You're like whoa, I, I can't believe I spent that much in this one category. It's really easy to be unconscious and to slip into that unconsciousness. So that's one thing. Like, just I would sort of assess their degree of consciousness around this. And um, some people can get really excited about becoming more conscious. Other people want to avoid it and not really think about it because it's going to lead to un some uncomfortable conversations. Um, another way to look at it, too, is, is budgeting, like this concept of having a budget. That probably excites your engineer clients, but nobody mm -hmm. else. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, we <laughs> have a ten engineers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So most people don't want to budget. You know, it sounds like it, it has the same sort of emotional impact as a diet, you know, and, and when you start to think about dieting, you think, okay, I'm going to start restricting myself. I'm going to take yeah. away pleasure. I'm going to cut out things that I love in my life. No wonder people don't want to do bed budgets. Mm -hmm. And so the one way, a workaround that really helps psychologically is to think about a spending plan. So one thing, one thing I would do with that couple is try to get really clear on what's the most important things to them in terms of what they want out of life and make sure you're funding those, right? And then you can look at the other stuff. It's actually sort of going a budget, um, going into a budget in a much more emotionally acceptable and fun way because yeah. you get to talk about what you really care about. Um, the other thing too is, and this is more directed to you as a financial planner, try to make it more visual for clients. So it's, it's like many of us operate um, we think people just, if you just give them the information and we just talk about it, it all makes sense. It really doesn't. We're, we're back to that emotional brain. That is what makes our decisions. And it's extremely visual. That's why we're so impacted by the numbers on the screen or the, you know, mm -hmm. the, they put graphs, right? And you're like, whoa, the red. Oh no, scary. That's kind of how we, we work. Our brains work. And so trying to find that, make that message more visual for people, really mm -hmm. powerful. Yeah. Well, the danger in some of those relationships is they're, they're going to be so stubborn. They're going to continue to shop around until some advisor tells them, oh yeah, we can do that. Right. That, that's a sustainable withdrawal rate at 10% a year, which both of us know isn't true. Uh, yeah. You, know, you mentioned vision. So I, I don't want to get off the, the track here, but you know, we mentioned vision a couple of times. You said you had a little vision kind of like, sound like a focus group that you'd put together where they kind of created this retirement or this vision for the future uh, based around their finances yeah, I, I'm wondering, you know, we, we do this on the front end of our planning. You know, this is, this really comes down to purpose and meaning, you know, for us. And I'm wondering what you, what your method is to help people create a vision for the for their retirement. So I find it's incredibly difficult to create a vision prior to retirement. Now, once we get into retirement, maybe we've been there for a few months or a couple of years, it, it gets a little easier. What are we doing before we retire to best set ourselves up for that? Yeah. So what we found again is a massive increase in savings behavior when people got really specific around the goal. So it was actually less about the mechanics. I, everyone already knows what they should be doing, frankly. This is, you're right. talking to a psychologist, right? <laughs> but, but yeah, it, everyone already knows what they should be doing financially. That's sort of one of the um, things we've discovered. And if, there's, if they're not doing it, it's because there's something missing psychologically. There's something missing emotionally for them. Um, and so the more specific you can get about what it is you want, the more motivated you are going to be to get it. Because essentially... To save money for the future goes against our, our wiring as human beings. You're actually asking yourself to do something that is um, the opposite of how we're sort of wired to behave. 
And if you think about it, much, much of our development in terms of our brain and our species and all <laughs> and how we look at the world was developed in hunter gatherer tribes, right? And so this whole concept of sort of hoarding and holding on to things never happened. Number one, you had to share with everybody. Number two, you were mobile, so you couldn't carry a bunch of stuff with you. So you couldn't really acquire a bunch of stuff. Um, and so we're wired to not do that. We're also wired to consume as much as possible right now because you're not sure when, when there's more coming. And so many of our clients um, that we're working with have already sort of overcome this natural wiring that people have. Um, and one way to harness to get you to save more or really shift your behavior is to get extremely visual around why you want to do it to begin with. And so what we did in our studies, we've done it a few different ways, but one of the ways we did it is have people basically essentially imagine themselves in the future. Like, who are you? Who are you with? What are you doing? What are you doing when you get up in the morning every day? Um, how are you feeling? Where are you located? Just getting really, so one, one way to do it is conversationally, just sort of answering those questions. Um, and then what works even better than that is actually having people create an actual vision, like show it on paper. Um, yeah. And so what we did in our studies, we've done it a couple different ways, but one way we did it was to have people either do drawings or cut out paper, you know, magazine clipping. So you can think of like a vision board um, as being extremely powerful for people. Um, it, it actually helps you motivate yourself to, to like um, forego pleasure right now for future benefits because you have to sort of override that natural instinct. Um, and as we talked about, some of our clients get stuck in that and we got to reverse it and unwind it to get them to enjoy life because that's the other irony here too is, and you asked to me, what, what do I do for myself too around my own issues? Well, my own issue is there's not enough money. And so my wife didn't grow up like that. And so I think it was probably one of the reasons I was attracted to her is because she seemed to be, be able to enjoy life mm -hmm. a little bit more than I was, you know? <laughs> um, and so it caused some stress in our relationship because, you know, at first you're attracted to that person and then later you're sort of freaked out and afraid that, you know, they're going to ruin everything, right? By having this different way of looking at the world. But essentially that's sort of the balance everybody really needs to achieve. And so um, people who do best in retirement are ones who can actually enjoy some time off pre-retirement. Those are the people who are actually going to have the best benefit. And so um, listeners out there, if you um, don't really enjoy your vacations because you're such a workaholic, that's sort of your goal is to find ways to enjoy that time off and find meaning in that and pleasure in that because that will lead to a more successful retirement for you. But really, essentially, it's about that balance and trying to find, yes, save for the future. And yes, you need to enjoy today, too. Yeah. Now, I bet there's some out there going, is this guy an advisor? Because this doesn't sound like a financial advisor I've ever spoken to before. Yeah, I think sometimes people will come in, they'll sit down in our conference room, we start having a conversation like this. I'm sure you've experienced, they go, yeah, I, uh, why don't you just tell me what to do with my money? Right. They just, you know, get to it and tell me what to do with my money. And that's not where we start. That's not what we stand for. And I wonder if this kind of comes back to what you put together, a financial life plan, right? There, there's, what is the difference between a financial life plan and a financial plan? How do you tee that up and help people understand the difference? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's, it's not so much of a formal document. You know, the financial plan is, is an easier document to formulize, uh, formalize. But for me, it's, it's, like, it's like, you know, why are we doing this to begin with? And it even goes to why am I even helping people with their money? You know, it's like, do I enjoy investments? Yes. Do I, do I find it fascinating? Of course I do. But that's not why I'm in this business at all. Um, I, I'm in this business because money is such a powerful influencer in people's lives. And um, it's, it, it impacts every aspect of their life. And essentially, Casey, and I know you'll totally agree with this, I want clients who are healthy, who are happy, who are living their best life, and money is a huge part of that. And so for me anyway, it, it's less about what's actually happening in the markets and investments, which is a totally important, but it's what, what does that mean to you, and how does that matter, and how does that make your life better? I'm not interested in, um, in helping people achieve a goal that actually makes them more miserable, you know, mm -hmm. um, or doesn't sort of really meet what is most important to them. And so anyway, for me, it's like, I can't separate the two because that, that's, I'm interested in people's overall uh, financial health, emotional health, relational health, and money is a, has a huge impact in all those areas. Well, where does, where do values fit into this process and vision and mission? And, you know, we've got mission statements, vision statements, we've got values. You know, when you think of it from a corporate perspective, um, where's, where do those types of things come into play when we're putting together a financial plan? 
Yeah, I think, well, you know, obviously they manifest themselves in the quote goals, you know, like a retirement or a vacation, that kind of thing. Um, so you're, you're looking at your values essentially there. Um, the opportunity I think for a lot of financial planners and, and frankly couples too, is have they ever really talked about those values and those goals together? And this mm-hmm. is another thing that can sort of trip up people's experience of retirement. And that is where a couple's never really sat down and shared, you know, first of all, what are my own values? Like, what am I, why am I saving all this money? What's the whole point? Um, and whether that's, you know, a charitable giving or an experience, you know, you want to make your life better for your children, or there's some sort of experience you want to have in life. It's really, it's really helpful to flesh that out. Um, and so many of us just sort of go through life without ever really doing that. And then the incredible benefit, too, is having that conversation with your spouse or partner. Oh, my goodness. Like, that, that's a conversation that a lot of people never really have. And so there's a tremendous opportunity as you're discovering why you're doing it, what you're doing, and what your retirement looks for, like for you, is that what does it look like for your spouse and your partner? Um, and sometimes it, it can be a little bit scary, right? Maybe you have totally different visions. Like one person imagines moving closer to the grandkids and spending a lot of time there. The other one wants to buy um, an RV and travel. <laughs> you know, traveled through the United States and, and of course, finding a way to meet both of those needs. But so many mm-hmm. of us aren't even really aware of the values ourselves, And so I think that's where financial planning can be really effective if you have a financial planner such as yourself who looks at things like that because you'll help draw out that what, what really matters to people. And actually, that's one of the things we included in our study too is, is like what are the values that are driving um, this passion for getting these certain things that you're saving for? You know, if you've got a couple that are listening in right now, uh, and I'm also, I'll say, you know, my wife and I, we're, we're kind of like your wife, <laughs> it sounds like, and you, uh, we're, we're a little different, you know, in the way that we grew up around money and uh, the way we approach work and things like that. And we have, to, we have to talk about those things on a regular basis. And if we've got someone listening uh, that's married, maybe a couple's listening right now, they're getting ready to, to tune this off, they're going to go back and have a conversation. What types of questions do you think that they should have uh, prepared as they enter this conversation? And what kinds of things should they maybe avoid or, or pitfalls to watch out for? Fabulous question. And, you know, money is, is the number one thing that couples fight about. You know, I mean, it's, it's one of the top ones. It's certainly the number one thing that couples divorce over in the early years of marriage. Like, this is a really hot topic for people. And a lot of times it's a lot of times it's because they come from different sides of the tracks or different family systems. They have different money scripts. And then basically they they fight about their money scripts, right? Like, no, we need to save more. No, but we need to enjoy today. And then what happens mm-hmm. over time is these positions get more and more extreme, right? Um, more and more extreme and entrenched. And after a while, you're so far out on this belief that you don't even believe it yourself, right? But you're trying to balance out your spouse who's got it all wrong, right? And you're desperately worried about that. And so You know, couples have a tendency, like before a couple goes to therapy, for example, and this is an alarming statistic, but they've been fighting over the same issue for about seven years, seven years of combat around trying to convince the other person essentially that they're wrong and that you're right. That's essentially what happens. Um, And it's so interesting, too, as I've done a lot of couples therapy and usually get somebody dragging the other person in. And and what they want is for you to help them tell the other person that they're wrong. (laughs) <laughs> that, that's how everyone yeah. comes into couples therapy. Oh, yeah. um, so anyway, it's, it's a hot topic and, and I'm giving you this framework because it's a really critically important topic too. And it's one that people ignore talking about. It is not uncommon to find people who've been married 30 years who've actually never sat down and actually talked much about money. And what happens is they, they have these little fights as they're walking by each other or snippy comments, you know, as, and so they're in the kitchen, but they've never really sat down and had the discussion they had on their third or fourth date around children, for example. Like at some point as you're dating, you're like, hey, do you want to have kids? You know, do you not? How many? This, this is a normal conversation, but we have, we have a tendency to skip right over that because as a culture, money is a taboo topic and it's something that people feel like they don't want to talk about and they don't know how to talk about it. So anyway, that, that's the frame. And when I work with couples in conflict, they've never had the discussion they should have had on date number three or four. And so what I like to do is take them away from whatever it is they're in conflict around right now, which is typically some sort of spending thing or how much you want to help your kids or stepchildren, that kind of thing. Um, take it out of that and go back and have the conversation that you should have had around date three or four. Um, and it, it's a powerful opportunity. And when couples take me up on this, it goes well. And, and actually, it'll loosen up some of what you're fighting about currently because it'll give you some perspective. And, 
it gives your it gives your partner an opportunity to talk about something maybe they've never talked about. And so the conversation is basically it goes like this, and it, it's similar to what you and I have been talking about in this conversation. What was it like for you growing up around money? You know, and and you listen to your partner talk about it. What did your mother teach you about money? What did your father teach you about money? What was your most joyful experience around money as a kid? Your most painful experience around money? What was your socioeconomic level and how did you feel about it? Like that's the important question, the follow-up question. How did you feel about it? Were you embarrassed? Were you proud? Were you ashamed? Like what, what emotion is attached to that? Because so much of our financial behavior, you can link to that, just that alone around how you compared yourself to others growing up and what it felt like. Um, and just as an example, some people feel a tremendous amount of guilt and shame because their family had more money than everyone else around them. And if you don't work through that, what you'll have a tendency to do is like sabotage yourself financially your whole life because you've associated this with a negative thing. Or some people feel deeply ashamed or um, embarrassed that they didn't have enough and they grew up feeling less than. And so they're never going to let that happen. So they want to make sure that they have, you know, what I would say are more status items that are sort of telling the world, hey, I'm, I'm okay mm-hmm. and I'm successful. A lot of these link back to those early experiences around money. The other question is, you know, um, what are your biggest financial fears? What are you most worried about? What are your biggest financial goals? Most couples have never talked about this. And so if you can go back and have that conversation, and then, of course, I always like to end it positively, which is, you know, what, what are you most proud of your partner around finances? You know, what, what pleases you the most and what are you most proud of and what's helped you the most? Um, and so that, that's one is those questions. And um, the other part to that, is incredibly important. And it's something that I train advisors on all across the country. And and I I know you've been trained in this and and you're good at this, Casey. That is listening, right? That is like how to be a good listener. And so the other partner then, their job is to just listen and reflect, Mm -hmm. not to, not to throw in your two cents, but to basically say, so, you know, for example, so you grew up poor and you felt embarrassed by that. Yes, that's right. And so your job is to listen, is to listen and reflect. And I got to tell you, even that, that little nugget right there, if you're, good, if you're good at listening and reflecting back what your partner said, it's incredible for your relationship. Mm-hmm. And it, it's the one tip that I, if I could give anybody, it's like the next time that your partner wants to talk about anything, just, just shift into listening mode a little bit and try to understand. So what was it like for you? you know, for example, sweetie, I'm really scared about the markets going down. Now, you're, you might have a tendency to be like, just relax. Everything's going to be fine. You know? Instead, say, well, what are you most afraid about? It's like your partner will probably be shocked and maybe even fall, fall over and faint if you're doing a reflective <laughs> response like that. Um, but anyway, so that therein is the opportunity. So couples haven't talked about this much. Um, so go back and have that conversation as if you're curious and you just met this person for the first time and um, you really want to understand them. So number one, that you're going to be able to talk about your own life history around money, which you've probably never done, number one. Number two, they're going to be hearing about it and understanding you on a whole new level. And what I've found with couples who do that successfully, and by successfully, I mean they're good listeners, is that whatever it is they're fighting about right now, it takes on a whole new meaning and a whole different perspective. Mm-hmm. And it loosens up sort of the sides we take, and people are much easier to, and better able to find a solution. Well, Brad, I, I feel a, a little 21 questions uh, framework coming. That's We're, we're going to be able to go to your website, click on this 21 questions link to be able to have this conversation with our spouse, right? That's a good idea. <laughs> no, I think that's a great <laughs> idea. No, I, I think, um, you know, over time, we just tend to get away from having intentional conversations at all. You know, we, we may have had some of these conversations at the front end of our relationship. However, people do change. And, you know, as you said, you know, we can potentially go further and further apart if we don't continually address these things and this this conversation reminds me of uh, a, a podcast that I listen to every once in a while called One Extraordinary Marriage. I actually got the uh, opportunity to see the two of them uh, speak uh, to a small group of uh, fathers and husbands, and uh, they had developed a list of questions, which you can check out on their website. So I'm just going to you know, give them a little plug here. Go check out One Extraordinary Marriage podcast, and then on their website, they give you a wonderful list of questions. And some of the questions that you've asked that you said you should ask here, they're on this list. And my wife and I have just taken this list of questions to date night and sat down and had these, you know, intentional conversations. And sometimes I, I just think there's value in having them already written down. Don't just try to pull them out of this conversation and start going back and having this conversation with your spouse. I think sit down, write down your questions, then make sure you can have a really intentional conversation.
And I think this carries over to your kids too. I know you're a father and I'm a father. And uh, I, I kind of want to wrap up this discussion with talking about, you know, as grandparents and as a parent, you know, wh what can we be doing to create uh, more, uh, to, to create more potential from a financial perspective in our children. You know, a lot of people are saying that, you know, they, they just don't teach these things in school like they should, and we have to do it at home. So what would your guidance be? What are you doing personally to make, um, to, to raise financially responsible children? Yeah. First of all, I love your word intentional. Um, so critical in terms of that, those conversations with your partner and spouse and also with your kids. So be intentional about, your children, your grandchildren, you got to be thinking about how things are looking from their end. Like what is their experience around money, for example? Um, things have radically changed. So it's not uncommon for kids to rarely see money nowadays. If you really think about it, there's not a lot of money changing hands. It, quite often it's cards being swiped, it's online clicks. So think about what that does to their understanding around money and their relationship with money. Because again, the human brain, only it does best with concrete visual things. And so do kids, obviously. That's how they learn. Um, and actually in our studies, a lot of what we did is we took stuff that, that you do in kindergarten and we did it with adults. And wow, it really works, right? Because kids are visual. They're kinesthetic. They want to see things. That's how they learn. And so be intentional about that. So one of the lost opportunities for people, for, for parents and grandparents around kids is allowance, just as an example. So allowance is a very lost opportunity for many, many people because one of the common complaints I get is like, I gave my kid his allowance and they blow it all on this or that. And it's like, well, of course they did, you know, you have to structure it. So what allowance is an opportunity to, to teach kids what you value around money. And so for example, what I do with my son is he gets an allowance and we, we do it in cash because I want him to have that, that experience and, but it's structured. So he's got um, four buckets actually. <laughs> he's got a spend it bucket, a save it bucket, an investment bucket, and a give it away bucket. And so we take his allowance and we divide it up into those various buckets. And it offers the opportunity for us to talk about each one. So what's the difference between saving and investing? You know, why, why, and actually it's so funny because with my son, oh, I'm kind of proud of this too, if I, if I was to be totally honest, but it's hard to get him to spend any money. And I'm like, yes, all right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's getting passed down. But as we mentioned, that can be a problem, right? Yeah. I want him yeah. to be able to spend money and to feel good about it and use money to enhance his life right now. Um, so anyway, it, it gives me a great opportunity to do that. And on the charitable side, um, we just started his allowance actually a year ago. So we haven't done this yet, but we've already been talking about what we're going to do with that giveaway money. And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, don't make it too difficult for your children. Think about one or two or three charities that you um, really value and then talk about those and have your child decide which one they want to give that to. Mm -hmm. um, and then my plan is to um, actually take him to that place so he can give it in person. So I, we can talk about it, look at it, have that feeling, have that experience, um, because those are the memories that these kids are going to walk away with. Um, other little hacks are like, if you're, if there's a, uh, a purchase for the family, like let's just say a new television just to make it easy. Um, sure. You can go ahead and swipe your card and buy it. How are you going to teach your kids and model for them that you're saving for something? How are you going to model for them that you are, um, comparison shopping, um, that kind of thing. So try to structure it, you know, like, Hey, this is what we want. Show them delay gratification. Okay. Just even if it's artificial, show them like, yes, we want to get this thing. We're not doing it right now because we're going to save up our money, and this is how we're going to do it. And then at the end, we're going to we're going to go have this experience together. Well, we use a pretty similar approach. That reminds me of uh, John Lanza, who uh, created the Money Mammals. He also wrote a book um, on raising um, money conscious children. And this was episode five. If you're if you're a dad or a mom, you want to go back and listen to uh, teaching your kids about money management. John Lanza does that for us in episode five. And I adopted his three jars, which are similar to yours. You just added one more jar. So we've got the spend jar, uh, the, the save jar, and we've got the share jar. So we've got spend, save, and share. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like integrating the investment jar as well. One of the things that he had brought up was kind of throwing some compound interest in there for the kids so they could visually see the additional dollars going in there as they put more in. You're giving them more interest, and it's accumulating in that investment bucket. Mm -hmm. And so always a fun thing. My, my son wanted to watch Onward 
the new uh, the new Pixar film. And I said, well, you know, right now it's 1999. And he said, well, how much is that? I said, well, it's it's all of your spend money. And he said, oh, okay. Well, maybe we'll wait on that one, right? And so he started to learn this delayed gratification. I think, you know, that's just fantastic. It's so. incredible, and 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 you know, Americans he's that's five years problem. old. Yeah. Yes, incredible. <laughs> Uh, so let, let's uh, wrap up our conversation with uh, maybe one or two final questions. And uh, I would like to ask you, know, how do you define meaning and purpose? Um, well, I mean, I have a very specific meaning for myself. And I think it's actually, um, you had mentioned corporations and mission statements. And I think it's really important to develop your own mission statement. Um, and so, I mean, for me personally, you know, the mean, mission statement I have is to help bring hope and healing to the world. And so this is, this is my mission statement. And so in all of my activities, for me, that's my mission statement. And I'll tell you what, it has tons of benefits. Like, for example, I don't get, I don't, I don't get nervous anymore doing media interviews, that kind of television stuff. I did it first because I was very much self-absorbed about how am I going to do, you know, and how are people going to look at me? But that, just as an example, that mission statement for me really calms me down because really what I want to do is there's, there's a listener on the other end of this, and I want to just give them a sense of hope and healing. Um, and so for me, anyway, that mission statement drives everything in my life. And um, I strongly encourage people to just sit down and actually create one. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love that. Um, and I, I want to, you mentioned retirement, you mentioned you're kind of a workaholic, and you really enjoy your work. And you know, much like myself, yeah, I really enjoy what I do. So you're probably one that doesn't ever plan on to traditionally retire, which there's more and more individuals like that today that aren't really ever planning on retiring. Uh, but they still have a definition or an idea of retirement. Sometimes it's a little different than others. What is what does retirement mean to you? What's your definition? In retirement? Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good question. So I guess for me, it's, it's, um, there, so there's two parts to this. One is I'm going to call myself out right after I say this, um, for, for, for my own, you know, shortcomings. Um, but for me anyway, it, it's being able to sort of do what I want, whenever I want, wherever I want. Um, and then here's the second part without this underlying need to make more money so that I have enough. And so, so I'm saying that that's my ideal my vision of retirement. And then I'm calling myself out because um, I need to have that experience right now. Yeah. And I know this. And so it's something I practice. Like I actually, I do have enough right now, Casey. <laughs> and if you think back in times of, of, you know, humanity throughout the generations, many of us do in terms of what we need to survive and mm -hmm. all of that. And so I already know that my ability to actually enjoy that on the other end is, is, is directly related to my ability to, to look at my life as being enough right now and having enough right now. Because it's the hedonic treadmill, man. Like, we are wired to never have enough, to never be satisfied. Um, and so this belief that once I get this, then I'll be happy, then I'll be relaxed, is, is a fallacy. You're never going to actually get there. And so the goal for me in my own life is to have that experience of abundance and enough right now. Yeah. Beautiful. Well said. And uh, Brad, thank you so much for joining. Can I, hey, can I ask, you know, there's someone that's out there and they want to connect with you. They want to learn more. Maybe they want to check out that survey that I found interesting. Uh, how can they learn more about you, Brad? Yeah. So probably my website, bradklontz.com. It's got a link to all my work and, and various activities. Awesome. Well, we will put that link in the show notes, and I'm sure we will uh, be talking more in the near future. Thank you. Thank you.